And welcome to the Vani Podcast, the podcast making you invulnerable to the coercion of the state and the servile society. I'm your host, Shane Rayo 2, coming to you from the Free Republic of Pasadena, the self liberators paradise. Uh, if you're new here and want to learn more about this ever-expanding, vetted parallel network, or wish to get more involved, please visit Pasnia, P-A-Z-N-I-A, dot com. So every conversation I have on this podcast, uh, at least in my opinion, obviously, is important and rev- revelatory in one way or another, uh, but today will be an even grander pleasure uh, for me. Uh, reason being, today I'm joined by Gabriel Custodiet, uh, most noteworthy of the Watchmen Privacy Podcast. Uh, but as of late, uh, a lot of great work with our friend Urban uh, Hacker, or Urban Hernandez, uh, over at EscapeTheTechnocracy.com. Uh, more on that momentarily. Uh, Gabriel is a no-bullshit kind of guy. Uh, he's not after getting most podcast downloads, website views, or uh, serve all society clouts. Uh, no, much much like me, uh, it's about delivering the best practical knowledge, uh, quality over quantity, and uh, supporting, pro- uh, supporting the individuals and projects uh, risking their freedom to bring privacy to those who recognize they need it desperately. Uh, all of those reasons alone are ma- are a major reason why are major reasons why I appreciate Gabriel. Uh, but that's not all. Uh, over at EscapeTheTechnocracy dot com, he and Urban Hacker are offering the privacy course I would offer if I put together one. Uh, thankfully, now I don't have to give it a second thought and can point you uh, in that direction. Uh, though I will say, if you've been here at the Vani Podcast for the five plus years of our ever ongo- ever ongoing crypto anarchy series, uh, or if you're running your own Start Nine server, Lightning Node, using Linux daily, uh, or programming our tools for freedom, freedom and privacy, uh, this course might not be for you. But if you're one of those many who've asked me questions like, uh, "Can you put together a digital privacy guide for dummies?" Um, well, you're in luck, and there's literally nowhere else on the interwebs I would send you. Uh, just visit escapethetechnocracy.com, uh, navigate over to the video course, uh, add it to your cart, and use code VANU to save 15% off the purchase price uh, of the course. At current, the module list is Linux, Internet Privacy Part 1, Digital Minimalism, Monero, Backups and Data Sovereignty, Internet Privacy Part 2, the technoc- Technocratic Food System, and uh, more coming soon. Speaking for myself, if I would have watched this when I truly dove, dove down the Linux and privacy rabbit hole back in 2020, uh, many of the hurdles and problems I ran into would have been easier to tackle. Uh, and if I would have, and I would have saved a lot of time, um, and probably a lot of money too, uh, annual voting with my dollars, supporting actual self-liberators, uh, not dealing with the so-called customer support at Proton, uh, doing shit the right way from the start. Again, visit EscapeTheTechnocracy.com, uh, add the video course to your car, use coupon, coupon code VANU, to say 15% uh, and to also support my efforts uh, in that of the second realm. And uh, a late yet, yet extremely exciting addition here, uh, Urban Hacker is also joining us. Um, so yeah, uh, all that being important, uh, finally, Gabriel, uh, Urban, welcome to the Ivani podcast. Uh, thanks so much for being here. And also thanks for doing, you know, for standing by for the ridiculous um, onslaught technical difficulties that um, has popped up as of late for me. Um, so I'll be working on that. But anyway, thank you so much for being here. Um, yeah, looking forward to, to chatting. Um, how are you guys today? Uh, Gabriel and Urban, how are you guys? Yeah, th- thank you so much for, for having us. Obviously, we're familiar with your show and, and we've enjoyed it as well. And you do great work. Um, yeah, no, very, very happy to be here. Appreciate the introduction. Um, I need to get you to, uh, you know, give me daily pep talks. That was, that was pretty awesome. And, uh, yeah, no, for, for our team up on this, uh, course, escape the technocracy. Um, I think you're, you're right to suggest that this is not for super elite hackers. Um, however, we, we are developing the course and it is increasingly getting more advanced. So, um, anyway, people can go over there and, and make a decision for themselves about it. So, uh, yeah, no, happy to be here. Oh, we also accept Monero, um, and Bitcoin for payment on there. So, yep. And uh, Urban, you want to introduce yourself? Hi, uh, thank you a lot uh, for uh, inviting uh, Gabriel and and myself. Yeah, so we we are building this course and um, the idea is to offer a comprehensive 360 um, platform that you can um, get relevant information and uh, especially information that are uh you know that have the most impact uh, if you want to increase your your privacy um so yeah we we start very simple and then we plan to have a more advanced module or or even other courses but that's going to be in the future and um i think the product itself is easy enough to be followed by most people who are familiar with the computer. Yeah, no, I, I certainly agree. And uh, that's that's great news that it's, uh, I figured it was going to continuously be developed, but I wasn't sure what the uh, 
what your future plans for it were. Um, but yeah, you know, I, I'm, uh, I'm certainly appreciative, uh, to, to, you know, to, um, you know, to have access to it and, um, I will, uh, yeah, most certainly keep updating myself. And you know, again, I'd recommend my, my audience, uh, definitely, definitely check it out. Um, so yeah, I guess to, to start off here, uh, obviously I like to get a back, a little background on, uh, on the self liberators we have on this podcast. Um, obviously reveal as much or as little as you want to. And, you know, obviously we're, you know, we're, uh, it's a very privacy focused podcast. So if you want to share less, obviously we're okay with that. Um, but yeah, I guess we'll, we'll start with you, Gabriel. Uh, what's your, uh, you know, quote unquote origin story? Uh, how'd you get involved in, uh, realms of freedom, privacy, podcasting, et cetera. Um, who inspired you at the start? Who inspired you on the way, et cetera? Yeah, no, I always appreciate this, um, asking this other privacy guy. You know, I grew up in the streets of Karachi, and I watched my my parents um, both die at a young age. And at, at that point, I realized that I needed to fight for liberty and, and justice for everyone. Um, and then uh, later on, you know, uh, just kind of go went through the normal routine. Um, and, you know, a few years ago, I came upon the correct politics and I started to understand the world a little bit more. And I started to realize that uh, privacy was very important. I didn't, I liked some of the way it was being talked about, but not in other ways. I think there's a lot of uh, communists that are in the privacy advice sections, and they're obviously not being very helpful because their worldview is not one that actually sustains freedom or privacy. And so I created my own show. I wrote a book, a privacy guide. And I started talking about not just privacy tactics and willing to go deeper than most, right? A lot of people not willing to talk about Monero, not willing to talk about torrenting, other sorts of things. Uh, I'm willing to pass that uh, boundary, shall we say. I'm also willing to talk about the philosophy that undergirds privacy, which is anarchy, libertarianism, something of this sort, obviously. Um, much limited government, let's just say that. And so I talk philosophy as well on the, the show. Um, and, you know, so I think people can see my background, both in a little bit of tech, but also some of the, the philosophy and the ideas that are also important to kind of get a comprehensive view of privacy. So that's where I'm coming from with Watchman Privacy. Yeah, amazing. And, and, I, and I love that. Um, sorry, I'll, I'll jump in just for a second, because you point out something really important that we've talked about on the podcast a lot. And that's the uh, something that Rio talked about in the 60s and 70s, but the importance of both philosophy, uh, um, you know, uh, philosophy and action or theory and practice. So like, they're, they're both necessary without one year. If you're if you're missing one of those things, um, you're missing half the picture. Um, but uh, so yes, that's 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 amazing to hear, man. Um, amazing to hear. But yeah, Urban. Um, yeah, it's uh, uh, we I was definitely planning on having you on the Vonnie podcast sometime soon. But uh, you know, it's uh, so again, great to have you. It's it's definitely a great surprise. But uh, yeah, your turn. Uh, your origin story. Huh? How'd you how'd you get here? Yeah. Um, so um, I um, I come from a country that had the the pleasure of of knowing uh, the beauty of communism, and my my family fled. Uh, the country to to come and it always um i don't know it's like always something that um made me aware of of uh what was happening also on a on a young age um having you know the family migrating and and trying to settle in uh in another uh, place um and i remember uh as as a kid when when i got a computer I was mesmerized by it, you know, um, you could join like VBS, um, like Bolton board, you could chat with other people and it was this sense of freedom and, uh, it was just something really incredible and everyone was making their own web page and, and forums. And, um, I quickly discovered Linux. I then went into cybersecurity and, uh, sysadmin. I did a course there for several years. It was a very, um, I never really liked university. So this was like all practice. Literally we had to build, you know, a lab and then we would try to attack it to, you know, destroy each other's computer and, and do those kind of stuff. And at the same time I was playing with Linux and, and I saw basically, you know, like our freedom getting less and less present and just this slow grind into, you know, more censorship, um, uh, like social, like centralized social media, uh, slowly destroying, uh, what I knew and, and I loved. And, but at the same time, I was not satisfied with the open source and the free software movement. 
I think there are two aspects to it. There is the very left wing, uh, very communistic, as Gabriel mentioned. And I couldn't really identify this. Um, so yeah, and for a long time, I, I, I was a bit lost. I didn't really know. Um, and everyone ar around me was, you know, just cheering for the next thing. So fast forward, um, I started to focus like, um, I thought technology could help, especially with things like freedom of speech with like strong encryption. And I started to modify my cybersecurity training. So I was a cybersecurity uh, training officer and I started to modify my course to push people to use basically the strongest encryption and the best software I could imagine. And it's kind of funny how it, how it basically went and, and then just took, uh, took over my life because when you start to become an expert then people rely on you and then you go on many rabbit holes. So yeah, this is a bit my, my story. And of course, I think as with many people, COVID just, uh, confirmed a lot of what I was suspecting and yeah. Um, so that's, that's a bit, the, my background. I'm also a video game enthusiast and I work for a video game studio and it was a lot of fun and I, I had a lot of pleasure. And it's something that I, I cherish from time to time. I like to do some art or some, some video game. It's, it's something that I love doing. Nice, yeah. man. That's, uh, that's, that's awesome. And I knew you, uh, were, were definitely in the realm of, uh, of, of, you know, programming and developing, um, even beyond that cybersecurity, but, um, yeah, the, the video game developing parts, uh, certainly cool. Um, I guess one comment that you, both of you guys kind of, uh, kind of hit on, uh, something I've noticed too, um, and not only in the realm of, you know, quote unquote, free and open source, um, you know, like regarding, I guess, yeah, regarding kind of the, I guess that communistic perspective, but I've seen the same thing with, you know, so-called free energy. Um, people hear that word and think free is in money. And it's like, no, that's not, um, no, you know, like there's, there's always an exertion of energy, you know, exertion of, you know, energy and effort. Like it's not, nothing ever is ever free in that sense. Um, but yeah, free is in freedom. So, um, yeah, I guess we, we've come across, uh, um, many of the same folks, but, uh, anyway, I guess let, let's get on to, again, we were talking about really practical stuff. Let's get into it. Um, so I guess starting with, uh, I guess with the topic, uh, or I guess, yeah, starting with, with this, um, even before I got into the action part of privacy, um, I had Jamin become in my ear, um, saying that he, he does our, our hardware hacking for our, our ghost phones and ghost pads that are on the uh, libertyattack.com website. But, uh, he always told me, uh, you know, it doesn't matter how secure the software or the encryption is, uh, if the hardware can screen capture it before encryption, or if it can spy on you, um, can control it without your permission, like with the Intel management engines, um, so yeah, if, they, if they're yeah, and if there's an you know an, an Intel management on, engine on board, it doesn't matter if you have it. Really doesn't matter that much if you have Linux, um, or if you're using SimpleX, or if uh, if they can screen capture your desktop every five seconds. Um, now I do know with SimpleX on um, on mobile, they prevent screen capturing. I'm not sure, I don't know about desktop. I haven't actually used it that much on desktop. Um, so that's good. But anyway, the the underlying problem is still there. If if you um, are using compromised hardware, um, the best software and the best encryption, um, you know. Um, you know, it doesn't mean as much. Um, and not saying it's, uh, you know, if you have a, if you have a, a, a lap, an old laptop that has compromised hardware, obviously, you know, taking steps in the direction of privacy and security is great. Um, you know, never let the perfect be the enemy of the good. But still, this is important, I think, to um, to acknowledge it's something Jamin's been screaming bloody murder about for a long time. Um, and with your expertise, um, Urban, and, and yeah, you too, Gabriel, I'm, I'm, I'm really curious, um, like, uh, uh, what would your ideal, um, you know, if, if someone, um, and, and again, this doesn't have to be introductory. Um, you can, I mean, you can, I guess it doesn't have to be introductory. We can go into, into as much detail and depth as you like, but what would, I guess, um, an ideal privacy or security setup look like? Uh, you know, hardware, software, um, operational security, um, et cetera. Um, and I guess uh, we can start with you, Gabriel, and you know, we'll jump over to Durban afterwards. Yeah, so I follow what you're saying. Basically, we're, we're jumping down the rabbit hole right away, which is, which is fine, which is good. Um, <laughs> the Intel management engine and AMD also has the, the two main um, computer chip companies, AMD and Intel, have, both have a feature where basically just baked onto their chip, they have the ability theoretically to see all the activities on your computer, um, should that be activated. And what does it matter, right, is what you're asking. What does it matter if we're using things that we recommend like Linux, which helps you escape the Windows, Windows uh, ecosystem where 
it's which is becoming increasingly surveying and for all we know right now because it's closed source they're already doing a lot of surveillance um linux which helps you escape the mac operating system and all of its problems which might not be as bad as microsoft but as long as you're exiting you may as well go to linux what does it matter the FOSS that you're using things that we recommend like keypass xc and all the other good free and open source software what does that matter if amd and intel can just get past that immediately right from the start so what I would say here is that I don't, I'll just be honest, and, and I think Urban's also in this camp, we don't know enough about the Intel management engine uh, to, to be certain. Um, I've been looking for people who could talk about this, discuss this. Maybe you'll connect me with, with your friend. That would be useful. I don't know enough about it to be able to speak on it authoritatively. So when I approach this, I do it in a couple of ways. First of all, I think just like people who say, uh, you know, Tor is compromised, et cetera. If this was the case, then we wouldn't have uh, criminals and people on the fringes who evade government authorities for so long. They would they would have been captured right away. Um, I don't know of any instance where Intel Management Engine was brought up as a way that, oh, this person was surveyed or caught or things of this sort. So that does bring me some comfort. Now, that doesn't mean that I'm necessarily satisfied. Uh, I, I think for, for most people that we can kind of rest on that and say, okay, it's probably not the end of the world. However, if you really want to escape that kind of stuff, there are some companies, I think of System76, they have a couple of laptops that disable Intel Management Engine on the chip. Now that does mean that you're, you're going to be using an older chip because uh, it takes a long time for them to actually disable that. It's a complex process. Uh, there are guides out there for very advanced users where you can try to go about disabling it yourself. If you are not able to do that, one thing you could do is you could just get a offline computer, your burner computer, and just use it offline and never connect it to the internet. So that, and you can, you know, find a way to make use of the internet in, in other ways. That would be an option. Uh, but those are kind of my thoughts on the IME and uh, AMD's uh, PSP. No, oh, that's uh, that that's great, and I I I, pr I appreciate that that nuanced perspective. Um, yeah, I, I really do, and and um, um yeah, and and yeah, yeah, I, I really yeah really do appreciate that. So Jamin's been hardware hacking, and you mentioned the old laptops, the uh, ghost the ghost pads that we offer are pretty much exclusively old, old Lenovo ThinkPads, um, or the one Lenovo X two hundred tablets. Um, but he's starting to find um that you can disable the Intel management engine, and 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 he's been doing experiment experimentation on this for like twenty years, trying to figure out what what laptops you can pull it out, like pull the IME out, and it not brick. Uh, and he's found I think three in like twenty years. So yeah, it's not an easy process. Um, at all, uh, which is why I, I outsource a lot of this stuff to Jamin because I, I all of the all of the R and D that he does is is just wild. Um, I don't know how he how he gets how he I don't know how he manages his permaculture homestead. But um, anyway, Urban, <laughs> what are your thoughts on this? Yeah, um, for me, the Intel ME is a bit like a, a a dragon that I feel like every so and often I, I need to fight it off. In the sense, I I think. It's mostly a distraction. Um, and as Gabriel said, you know, um, there is this uh, video of chain uh, analysis uh, doing Monero uh, transaction uh, tracing. And, and they explain the, the tactics they use in, in the video. And, and if you watch the clip or if you watch the PowerPoint that they have, they didn't use the Intel ME to break into the nodes, right? No, they made fake nodes and then they use statistic analysis and they use good old IP tracing and data from exchange. That's how they did it. Um, I think the risk really? of Intel ME is overblown. I've never really seen a case where it was used in the way people think it's used. Now, again, I'm, I'm sure it can happen uh, it, technically. I will also say from all, like most modern ship nowadays have some kind of management built in, right? So the, the, the reason why this was made is mainly for data centers. Uh, if your computer uh, bricks for some reason, you want like another access without having to, you know, go physically on the, the shelf, on the rack, and then pu pulling out the, the computer and connecting a keyboard to it. You want to do it remotely. So th this was like the, 
the original uh, idea and, and design of uh, Intel ME and, and others. And Intel ME is probably the one we know the best because it's so infamous. All the other manufacturers have some kind of capabilities. And in many cases, it's, it's even like even more hidden uh, than Intel ME. So I, I wouldn't worry too much about it. I think um, if this becomes a problem, we will know. And then naturally more resource will be uh, allocated to try to prevent it. But I think even with Intel ME enabled, but you still disable the remote access on the BIOS, right? So it's still technically there, but you don't have this one-way access. Uh, so it's, I don't know, segregated a bit. And then you encrypt, you encrypt your partition and you use Linux. You're going to be way better. If you look at how people lose access to their data is the cloud company got hacked. It's uh, JavaScript in your browser. You know, no one discuss about it. Like no one disabled JavaScript in their browser. And yet this is one of the most, <laughs> this is like the number one vulnerability when you browse It's the JavaScript. So I think we need to keep, uh, <laughs> we need to keep things a bit realistic. Um, so this is my, my view on, on Intel. I mean, I, I don't lose sleep over it. And that's actually really, that's actually really great to hear. Um, go ahead, Gabriel. Yeah, that, that's great to hear. Um, go ahead. Yeah, I was just, I was just going to also add, first of all, I'm, I'm the last person who's going to say, uh, you know, don't pursue something if you want to, obviously, uh, go and, and, and look into Intel management engine and get around it if you would like. But I, I do agree that sometimes you can take the black pill a little bit too soon and you lose out on what is more likely the case, which is that. IME is not spying on you and you have all these op real options for privacy. So I do hear people say Tor is compromised. Um, all these things are compromised. And I sometimes think that itself is, is the PSYOP because people don't want you to, to use them. And I do think that if they were a compromise, we would see a lot more people getting, uh, you know, wrecked as a result of using them. But, you know, the fact is that Ross Ulbrich, who was running um, Silk Road, uh, via Tor, it took them years and years to even know anything about this guy. So um, you could say that, hey, they're, they want everybody to be using it. So years down the road, they're going to nail everybody. I, I don't think the logic on that checks out. So I just want people to be cautious, like Urban is saying, don't take the black pill. There's a lot you can do. And, uh, you know, are, are there is there a, you know, Thanos snap his fingers and they have access to your computer? Theoretically, but don't lose out sleep and don't lose out on all the other opportunities. Um, because of that. Yes, that that's, uh, yeah, most certainly true. Most certainly, most certainly true. And, and one thing we'll talk about, um, it's not necessarily next in conversation, but when we talk about Monero privacy, I've got a, a question, kind of that same thing, you know, like Tor is compromised, Monero is compromised. Um, so no, that, that is, no, I, I, I understand. Um, and, but I, you know, I appreciate you, every, you always got to be on your toes though. Always got to be on your toes. Um, so I, I do appreciate, appreciate that perspective a lot though. And even just in terms of, um, even if you're not necessarily talking about privacy or, or security, um, which are obviously, obviously just come with dumping windows, um, or dumping, uh, dumping Apple, but, um, just the, like, uh, we have a work computer and uh, it had windows on it. It's only one of the, the only, um, one of the only windows computers I use now. And it's just, it's windows, windows, like, you know, it's the newest windows and like there's notifications all the time. It never leaves you alone. It forces you to use an antivirus and you can't really fix things too easily. If, um, at least I, I can find, I can fix things easier in Linux, it seems because they don't lock everything down. Um, but yeah, even just the convenience I've found, um, from, from using, um, using Linux, not having to deal with windows, um, that's a, a major improvement in and of itself and not having all the bloatware. The bloatware is also a problem, um, major problem. But anyway, um, so yeah, that, that's all That's all good news. Um, good to hear. Um, so I guess uh, let's go ahead and jump forward here. I'm talking about half hour almost already. Um, but yeah, next, uh, Simplex, um, one of these these great, um, great new tools. Uh, we've been looking for, um, for a year or two, we've had a, a few Pasnia Second Realm Assemblies um, about it, like trying to choose the new, you know, communications platform we're going to go to, whether it was going to be Threema or, um, or Session or Simplex or XMPP or Jitsi, whatever, whatever the, you know, all the Indo, Indo solutions out there. Um, but we were, we were talking about it a lot because, you know, there's way too many chat, out, chat apps out there now. And if we're going to migrate once, we're going to migrate once. We're not doing this. We're not doing this again. 
Um, and Simplex is uh, for me uh, about a year ago. Uh, it was it was it seemed to be the you know the the easy easy answer. Um, I guess I kind of lost track of it for a little bit, and um, as of late, it's it's kind of really really come back into the purview. And I think that's where we're going to switch the I guess the, the Pasnia Community Correspondence chat over to, um, and and also um, just what I'm recommending to people that I connect with is yeah, let's move over to Simplex over Signal and Telegram and and places like that. Um, and also love the uh, with Simplex, it's you know based off of the relays. Um, so like I, I envision, um, I'm not sure how much you guys know about Pasnia, but basically uh, <clears throat> a decentralized country with permanent autonomous zones, um, homesteads, locations across the U.S., across the world. Um, and in these places, like for me, like what's screaming out in my head is like you could have like local simple X relays. Like uh, um, I know like uh, <laughs> it's... Um, yeah, and I guess it's, this might play into Noster too, but um, at least for Simplex here, um, you know, like uh, thinking about communicating with people that you're know, staying here on the homestead or people that visit, um, it seems kind of nonsensical for a message to leave the homestead on a cellular network only to return about 50 yards away. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, I one, I guess it, beyond all of the other benefits of Simplex, um, I'm thinking like we'd have our, have our own like local mesh communication network very easily with Simplex. I know that's possible with Briar too, but um Simplex is definitely more advanced, so um, I'm curious what what's uh, I guess your your guys' thoughts on Simplex are like. Uh, well, um, you know, if, is it at the top of your list, and uh, you know what puts it there, um, and I guess what what potentialities may um, you may may I not be considering here, or may we not be considering here? And uh, yeah, Gabriel, go ahead, my friend. Yeah, no, I very much appreciate the antagonistic mindset. This really is how you have to think about these things. I'm just I'll just say this from the start, so people don't you know say, hey, why is he why does he keep doing this and, with the question. We try to be, we're, we're generalists, so we're, we're not always in the nitty gritty of what's happening with this particular private messenger or what's happening with the minutia of Monero or something like this. So especially me, I, I'm certainly a generalist, so I'm not the person who really should be getting to the nitty gritty of private messengers. And we're also trying to certainly get people to come into the privacy fold. So I always say that I'm, I'm more of the intermediate level. Um, you know, you have your Naomi Brockwells and, and such, and, and these people are kind of at the entry level. I'm at the intermediate level. I think Simplex is great. I think that uh, I interviewed the guy on our show. Uh, Urban and I played around with it. And, and this is where you get to the other side of these privacy tools, which is, can you migrate other people over to them? And is this where everybody else is going to go? Because the you have, and, and Urban put this very well in our last episode, uh, we had an episode that released today on Telegram, and he described some of the software as utopian software, where it has everything you can imagine. It's decentralized. Uh, you can have as many usernames as you want, as many accounts. It doesn't ask for any personal information. It has all these good things. However, it doesn't always necessarily have the best UI, and it's not always the most convenient, and that means that your family and other people are not going to migrate over to it. So it, it's a little bit lost the, the forest for the trees in terms of a messenger is about connecting people and people are going to connect better if they have a, a, a more easily functioning software. That's why Telegram has 1 billion users. And I'm not suggesting people use Telegram, but for example, comparing Simplex to Signal, uh, you know, Urban and I, just a couple months ago, we were using Simplex rigorously before this interview, and we found that, you know, we, we could not make phone calls within the application itself. Uh, we had a lot of trouble selecting files to send back and forth. There were a lot of small things, which I know over time will, you know, get ironed out, but uh, the, the, it, it was becoming such a hassle for us to communicate that we actually you know, went back over to what we were using. So these are also things to consider in in, in its sheer technology. And, and maybe Urban wants to get into um, some of that, maybe not. In terms of sheer technology, fantastic. I think you should definitely give Simplex a try. Give it a go. See if you can make it work. Um, if you're new to privacy, though, you might want to start with something like Signal or something else and, and then migrate over to Simplex when you feel more comfortable. Those are kind of my thoughts on it. Yeah. What about you, Urban? I'm here. I'm definitely curious what, what your thoughts on Simplex are in this conversation. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. As as Gabriel uh, say, we we tried it really hard uh, in in preparation, and we said that we were going to use it exclusively <laughs> for for a moment. Um, but I think everyone. Who, I think people really, really need to think about the user 
and they need to make the app a bit fun to use. And, and, and I know like, you know, when you're a cryptographer, you think about those, I don't know, beautiful double ratchet, fully encrypted quantum resistant, something, something. And that's great. But then if it's, if you don't have stickers and you cannot really use reactions and then your message arrive in a weird order, like all of those are tiny things and, and people like most people don't care. So then they just will switch back to WhatsApp. Right. And I think simplex is a good and incredibly like from a technology point of view, it's incredible what they achieve with so little resources, but it's too soon to migrate people. It needs a bit more polish. Um, I remember when Signal first arrived that it was not how it is now. They, they also had some issue contact were not properly synchronized. They, they had like things like this, but now it's kind of fun and you have a lot of the functionality that you find in others. And, you know, I, I believe we need to like the way we need to move people is to go with the simplest thing that give like the one thing I, I love asymmetrical, um, uh, advice in which you ask the user to change one little thing, but then the improvement is immediate and, and it's, um, it's something that benefits them and, and make them more secure. And if, if you see like most people still use SMS, you know what I mean? Like they, they still send from time to time SMS, which are completely unencrypted. So yeah, just switching to WhatsApp w would already be a big improvement. Now, of course, for something like Pez, yeah, of course, for something like Peznia, I would not uh, advise using WhatsApp. But I think we need to be realistic. And what I found when I try to onboard people uh, on, on Simplex, the answer I got was, but Herman, you told me to use Signal or to use this other thing. Why, why now another one? Do you know what <laughs> I mean? Yeah. So, and, and, and I find this is a bit hard. I think people like us, you know, enthusiasts, we need to take the torch and we need to kind of uh, go with it. But I think we also need to be realistic, you know, and, but I will tell you this, the best way you need to be a bit strict. And for instance, for me, I do not answer any SMS period. Like if you send me an SMS, it's going to be ignored. Um, and then you can contact me with other, other ways. And I think we also need to be a bit extreme sometime, you know, we need to be the one who push people, but I wouldn't push people in a solution that is not yet ready for uh, a bigger adoption. I appreciate this a lot. And it's like I said earlier, it's like, don't let the enemy be the, I guess the, or don't let the perfect be the enemy, the good. Um, but yeah, as far as Paznia goes, um, a lot of us are pretty, you know, far along the, I guess, the cyberpunk area. So like a lot of us are doing R&D and kind of investigating these things anyway. So it's, it's, it's kind of a passion too. Um, so yeah, no, like SimpleX, uh, a year ago when I kind of got turned off by it, um, it was pretty much kind of exactly what you said. I, um, you know, I got people over to it and I didn't get messages for a few days. And I was like, well, that's not good. What if I need to talk to them? Or what if they need to get a message to me? Um, not ready for game time. Um, but then, uh, uh, yeah, like I said, someone came here to Paznia a couple months ago, trusted confidant, and he was talking up Simplex again. I was like, damn it. Like, I think he's right. Like, in terms of, like, the radical solutions, um, he might, like, it, 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 it might be. But as far as, um, yeah, onboarding other people to different chat apps, no, I've stopped doing that. Um, I got my, uh, uh, it's funny, I, I got some, some relatives on a Telegram a few years ago, and I kind of regret that now. But um, I guess it's a step better than SMS. Um, uh, I, I didn't know any better back then. Um, and I'm definitely not going to onboard yeah. the Simplex now. That's not going to happen. Um, maybe five years from now. But then again, we don't know right. what's going to look like in five years. Yeah, go ahead, Gabriel. And, and ju just just to be clear, we're 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 definitely big advocates of go very far. And we know some of your audience is kind of rolling their eyes when we're not being extreme. Um, we're just more on the side, as I said, of of at the intermediate level. We're not looking into all these projects sometimes with 
serious, serious scrutiny. And I would certainly rely on others to do so. Um, so yeah, de by all means, go as far as you can. That's always my motto. Oh, yeah. Yeah. No, this is, this is definitely appreciated. Definitely appreciated. Um, you know, again, being realistic and, and you know, yeah, with a lot of these things I talk about, like one that I'll talk about later on, um, <laughs> these are like crazy ideas. And when I bring out to programmers and developers, like I know they're not easy to do, but a lot of them are impossible. So like they're fanciful and I need to be like me myself, not being a programmer or developer and not knowing how these actually think, like how, like I understand how complicated they are, but like, uh, yeah, anyway, it's good to be brought back to, to reality a little bit on some of these things, but um, at least speaking for myself personally. And you know, the... Yeah, and, and you know the, the the complex thing here is that the the gentleman we talked to who's developing Simplex, like this is his this is his job. This is what he does for fourteen hours a day. So the complexity involved in a lot of these privacy projects is just so immense that even people who devote their entire lives to it, they still don't know all of the details. So it's just become a very complex world. There's a lot of faith. There's a lot of trust that uh, people use it in, in place of reading line by line the code because there's just so many things that could go wrong. So, you know, you, you have to know your limitations sometimes. Yeah, and even with, I think just within the past week or past few weeks, uh, I think Jack Dorsey even gave him a million plus um, for developments. So, um, yeah, it tells you how much money uh, and how much, like, how again, you said, how much time and devotion it takes um for these things it's it's not easy you know it's it's uh yeah i guess it's yeah quote unquote revolutionary technology to put it that way um but yeah i guess getting on to other sorts of uh you know very revolutionary technology uh monero uh and i love the theme of this podcast so far I, like I, I i truly 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 do and i'm curious this is you already brought this up earlier urban um, regarding monero but uh um this is before i guess that chain analysis video and that stuff was really released uh re released recently but uh, yeah, truly trusted and tried colleague uh, has serious issues about Monero, um, though I, I feel the main issue is being addressed or at least discussed. Now I've seen it on Twitter. Like there, I think there's a new, um, what are they called? MIPS and Monero. I don't know what they're called, but um, improvement protocols for Monero might be looking to, to change this. But um, his message reads, and this is just a, a summary, but XMR privacy set is only 16, which makes it far more vulnerable to, to being cracked. Uh, the top secret processing power of state quantum computer is merely to be enough to have crack XMR well, we'll likely won't ever be able to crack R, um, which is uh, for those who don't really get involved too much in um, shit coins, I'll put it. Um, yeah, R is, I guess, a, a fork of Monero that fix, fixes this, but that nobody uses that I ever have come in contact with. But um, anyway, a high proportion of Bitcoin trades are already being linked to individuals, same for all other transparent uh, cryptocurrencies. So kind of what we were talking about earlier. I mean, my response is, was like, this is probably fear monger about, about Monero, like trying to scare people away from using Monero. Um, and, uh, the article that he talked about, it was this, uh, I think it was like a, a European, it was an article from Europe and they kind of talked like, they didn't reveal anything, but they just kind of like hinted to like, Oh, you know, Monero's cracked, uh, you know, it's, it's hacked. Um, but just as with a lot of these things, um, a, a lot of these cases, uh, like with the, yeah, the XMR tracing, um, the quote unquote XMR tracing happened. Um, I mean, a lot of this is just bad operational security. Uh, like, uh, like some of the people, uh, like some of the big, uh, exchange hacks, millions and billions of dollars. They're caught by like they they messed up and used like a Gmail email address once, um, or they didn't use VPN or and or Tor, um, or they're using centralized infiltrated coin swap services that could be correlated. Like the inputs and the outputs could be correlated um, with timing, um, IP addresses, as as you talked about earlier, Urban. And then yeah, just kind of the the worst offender of this, like accidentally you know connecting to a chain analysis public node. Um, so I guess I'm curious, and, and I I kind of I kind of anticipate the question now from from our conversation so far but um i guess we'll start with you this time urban um what do you think about monero privacy is, is monero you know is it is it hacked um what do you think so is monero hacked no it's not if it was the case a lot more people would be in deep trouble i mean you have entire darknet market running exclusively on monero and everyone who like I find the disinformation and the way people, um, how to say, um, turned the video that was leaked. I wouldn't call it released. I think it was leaked uh, from uh, this change of surveillance company. Like if you watch it, it's obvious they have a lot of trouble to trace and they rely 
a lot on outside uh, knowledge, um, as we have said. Now, if you look at Monero, every single feature of Monero taken separately seems very um, like it seems very uh, it seems very frivolous. You know, um, you look at ring signature. It's like oh, it's only one in sixteen. You know, it it could potentially be uh, leaked or it could potentially be like traced back. Then you look at uh, confidential amount. Oh yeah, the amount is confidential, but you know the fees are not, and you can still guess stuff from the fees. And then you look at the IP protection, which is Dandelion plus plus. And I remember before this video uh, of chain analysis, people were saying, "Oh, but um, you know Dandelion is not perfect, etc., cetera, etc." Cetera. But if you put all of this together, and we have seen this, for instance, with uh, Bitcoin, where they also implement something like Dandelion, but because they don't have all the feature of Monero, it's basically useless uh, because the surveillance can go around uh, around this. Well, in the case of Monero, you have multiple very different technology that are all like. That's sad we lost Urban there. He is in his desert compound, so that's probably why um, the, yeah, I, I'd love for him to to uh, finish that thought. I'll just uh, insert here while he reconnects. And, and, and I'll just add this here uh, so people don't think, oh, you, are you Monero shills? Certainly not. You know, a, a, a year ago, we were really big on the, the Bitcoin privacy. And then as uh, after Samurai Wallet's arrest, we, we've been really focused on Monero. And if something else clearly differentiates itself, we'll, we'll certainly be be interested in that. And I, I welcome all alternatives to Monero, all privacy cryptocurrencies, by all means, may, may the best person win. And we'll be happy to accept that when, when, when that becomes the uh, um, more accepted. And, and this is another important thing, which is that a cryptocurrency needs to be have a certain network effect for it to work, right? So uh, like all these utopian softwares that I previously mentioned, you can do all the right things, all the best things. Um, but if you're not, if you not, don't have a certain popularity, then people are not going to be accepting it. So the reason why Monero is, is powerful is because so many people these days are accepting it. Um, and that, that should not be underestimated. Um, and Urban, if you're here, we'd like you to finish your thoughts on, uh, the line of thinking you were going on. So, yeah, sh should I start again about this or? Just, yeah, I guess if you remember where you left off. Yeah, no, I think I, I hope I don't drop. Um, I really do. Okay, yes. So, um, is Monero broken? No, it's, it's not. If it was, there would be a lot of people in jail. And if you, I, I think the journalist who just probably not even saw the video and then ran with the story, I think they are incredibly dishonest and they just want click bite things. If you look at uh, this video yourself, you will see that um, they have a lot of respect for Monero and they are incredibly, um, it's, it's something that is incredibly hard to, to go and, and to trace uh, the funds uh, once they are in, in the Monero blockchain. Now, if you look at every feature that Monero is using to protect its user, uh, each of those taken separately, they, they look very frivolous, you know? Um, and some of them even are implemented in Bitcoin, like Dandelion++, which is uh, the one protecting the IP address of their user. But when they are put together, this is when they really work in, in, in a symbiotic way. And they are like walls, um, like a series of walls and layers that protect the users. So uh, if we take, for instance, uh, IP protection, you know, in, in Bitcoin, you have it, but then it doesn't really matter because, you know, you are using a KYC exchange and then the amounts are on clear on chain. So even if you hide your IP, it's pretty obvious what happened. Uh, while in Monero, the same thing becomes much more complicated because now suddenly you don't see the amount and there is one chance in 16 
uh, that you got the real person who sent. Um, I also think capabilities to do on-chain tracking are overblown. And if uh, you, I, I think everybody should at least once try to do some chain surveillance themselves and to see their own transaction in maybe something like mempool.space or other um, uh, blockchain viewers, and it's not that easy to trace transaction, but it might appear, uh, it, it might lead you on a goose chase. And I remember when I was doing some investigation and I was using OXT.me, which was the Samurai, their own uh, blockchain uh, analysis tool, that um, when you were uh, following the funds, it would be very easy to think you are on the right lead but then eventually you you would discover that you you were completely mistaken and i think this is the biggest one of the biggest danger of a tool like this um so i would say no monero is not compromised it works extremely effectively and yes if you take each of those like the detractor of monero they never look at the entire picture they only focus on a very tiny, simple thing. They, they will say, yeah, but you know, the ring is not perfect, but the ring is only one of the many things that are protecting the user. And if you put them all together, we see how powerful th this is. Um, yeah, so um, as for other chain, I, I have to be fair. Uh, I don't really know a lot about Pirate Chain or even Zcash. I, I did some research for, for this show. I think the free market, I mean, darknet market, they are under an extreme environment, right? Either it works and it's not shut down or it doesn't. And then it, they are immediately like destroyed. And I think there, there is a reason why uh, Monero is used there. I would also add that Monero is not just about privacy, but it al also has things like dynamic scaling, where if more user uses it, it will just make the block slightly bigger. Um, it has like a lot more things than just privacy, um, which are also, uh, I think, part of the, um, um, the reason why it's used uh, so widely. Yeah, if that's I, that's uh, that, yeah, it's amazing. Go ahead, Gabriel. Yeah, please go ahead, my brother. Go ahead. Yeah, and just to clarify one thing, one thing that Urban said. He said one of the biggest dangers. Um, he was referring to the to the point that one of the biggest dangers of blockchain analytics is not that they can actually find you, but that they will um, infer certain things that they don't actually know because it's it's so opaque. And and, and to be honest, I even get upset at at some of the Monero folks for bashing uh, just totally calling Bitcoin a surveillance coin. That's that's certainly not the case. If you have no KYC Bitcoin, you're you're doing pretty well. And, and you know, obviously we want people to to go further, uh, but we we also need to be realistic. And, and you know, the, there's two types of people in, in privacy. There's the one type who are the the developers, the people who are pushing the boundaries, developing new tools, anticipating the next obstacles, anticipating the next threat. And then there are people who are doing more kind of onboarding, showing how to use the current tools that are working and kind of how to make the most of them. And in the process, they bring in new people who will become that first group of people who will go to the cutting edge. And we're certainly in that second uh, category of people. Yeah. Yeah. And I, and I guess, uh, yeah, let, let me be clear. So like, uh, I, I say shit coins and, um, and Monero, um, I don't, I'm definitely not meaning that about Monero. Um, kind of like we were talking about earlier with adoption, like moving from community, you know, um, community, you know, chat apps to chat apps. Uh, it's, it's, Part of it is about like, like especially like for financial stuff. Like people don't accept the digital currency. Why would I hold it? Like, why, why would I ever hold it? Um, but anyway, yeah, Monero. Um, even you know, within the past, uh, even before the samurai or samurai arrest, um, when there were the a uh, couple times, a uh, couple times where the fees were so high, I had I had a transaction that took like five or six days to go through. It didn't happen much. People, you know, said it happened all the time. Is I, you, I've been using it for yeah a long time, and I, it it really only started happening um, last year. So I started using Monero more um, for that, you know, for that reason. 
And uh, then, yeah, after the, I guess, after the Samurai Rest, it's, it's now, um, I mean, yeah, I guess let me be clear to the, to the audience too. Like I probably, I, I, I recommend people submit Monero now um, just because I'm kind of still, I still don't know exactly um, how I want to go about the Bitcoin privacy um, thing now. And, and there's still no reason, there's, we, we, they go to trial, what, September 17th. So, I mean, um, there's still a lot, a lot of unanswered questions there. Um, but anyway, not that that's, that's super relevant. But anyway, um, yeah, I guess uh, um, part, you know, going back to Samurai, um, you know, what they were doing with the Bitcoin chain was, you know, adding doubt, right? That's that's kind of the goal. It's it's like adding doubt, um, you know, throughout the process. Um, and Monero by default, um, without doing the, the coin joining, without using all those amazing tool, tools that SW and, uh, and TDEV, you know, put out, um, and a lot of open source contributors too, um, you know, that, you know, Monero by default adds a lot of doubt just, you know, yeah, by default, you don't have to do these things. So, um, and and you guys are talking about you know like like darknet markets. Yeah, those are the ultimate test. Um, they really are. I mean, it's what put Bitcoin on the map via Silk Road, um, which a lot of the a lot of the uh, compliant Bitcoiners nowadays, um, you know, don't like to really look back at. Um, and Bitcoin would be nothing if it wasn't for Silk Road. Um, at least in, like uh, just looking back, like that's that's where the popularity came from, right? Is like it's perceived you know, perceived perceived privacy. Um, and yeah, again, Monero, um, you know, that's the, the ultimate test, um, real lives, seriously real consequences, um, et cetera. So yeah, I think you, you guys make amazing points, like just harking back to the Intel management engine. Um, yeah, but I, I already hear people saying they're, they're trying to encourage people not to use the most extreme tools because they're, you know, they're feds or something. Uh, no, by all means, use the most extreme tools. Um, it's just not going to work for the vast majority of people. And, and there's a good point about the, uh, the Silk Road. I, I saw somebody tweet recently, one of these Bitcoin maxis, or sorry, one of these Monero maxis who said uh, basically that how, you know, how did Bitcoin privacy work for the Silk Road? And it, it was a totally just disingenuous, misleading comment because Bitcoin privacy had nothing to do with the Ross Ulbricht being caught. If you, if you read how he got caught, basically they finally tracked him down. He had used his, he had used an email with his real name in it to comment on the early days of Silk Road on a forum. Like that's how they finally tracked him down right. after many years of the, the finest minds in government tracking him down. So it had nothing to do with Bitcoin privacy. There's a lot of disingenuous talk um, from Monero Maxi. So we do need to be realistic. For sure. Uh, Urban. Yeah, I I want to just. Yeah, I, I yeah, because you, you mentioned about Samurai, you know, how they were adding uncertainty. It's way more than uncertainty. I think we need to remember that Whirlpool was the only zero link coin join ever implemented in Bitcoin, which means once it's go through, there is zero link between what you had before and what you have now. It's it's unmatched. Like this is similar to something like, I don't know, uh, Tornado Cash, uh, maybe if, if you're familiar, but you had truly a complete break of any deterministic links of what happened previously and that is you won't find this in joint market and you don't find this in wasabi both of them they can add some uncertainty they help with privacy but they are not this perfect so, so you ask why, why are they going after samurai and uh, tornado cash yeah it's because they actually no, were... I were... yeah no i i mean yes of course but i was just you know Reminding, I, I, I don't know, it's just uncertainty seems a bit, I, th I think we need to pay proper respect of what was achieved there. Uh, that's, that's uh, I guess that's what I wanted to say. Uh, another thing, and I don't want to go um, too, too much into conspiracy, but um, a lot of the decisions that were taken into Bitcoin were not, in favor of merchant adoption, you know, and I, I just invite people like if, if you like, I, I mean, I love Bitcoin, I like it, but I would welcome everyone to think about all the decisions that were taken. And you will see that not much was done to actually help merchant having it. And when I mean merchant having it, I mean, true self-sovereign merchant. I wouldn't say wallet of Satoshi helps merchant. No, it's just another custodian. And you know, the other day I was helping my barber 
uh, who now accept. Uh... Urban, we're, we're, we're losing you again. Oh God. I, I'll finish the story for him Barbara actually. Accepts what? <laughs> um, actually I, I, I'll say something else while urban is clearly having some internet problems in his uh, desert compound. Um, so, so we're, we're, we are working on some, uh, a course actually, and some, and some knowledge to help people who are still in Bitcoin, who are, maybe are stuck in Bitcoin, who are still in Bitcoin, who still believe in Bitcoin for whatever reason, and they still want to use it. But urban's frustrations that he's talking about there and his, uh, his recent admiration, enhanced admiration for Samurai wallet is from the fact that he's been, we, we've been using these tools, join market, um, other sorts of tools out there, and they simply are not, not anywhere near where Samurai wallet was. Um, so are you back urban? So, um, so that's, that's kind yeah, of the, I'm, uh, the I'm thoughts on, about this. On, on Bitcoin. No, it's fine. It, you're talking about your barber, um, a, a, a situation with your barber. Yes. So um, what I was saying is, um, you know, I was trying to, I'm, I'm trying to convince uh, my barber to, to accept Bitcoin. And um, what I, like uh, yesterday, I actually was, uh, for the first time I saw his computer and we were trying to install a wallet, right? And he, he was basically not even using Chrome as a, as a, as a browser. Uh, he was using some kind of random browser made by some random antivirus company and its computer was completely outdated, you know, still with Windows 7. And like, those are the type of uh, scenarios that, you know, um, if you start to go and encounter uh, people in the real world, uh, this is the kind of stuff that, that you have. And um, this makes it very challenging sometimes because you know in your head what would be the perfect solution, but now you're faced uh, with, with something like this. And I think we need to, to be realistic. And in many of those cases, what, what I've noticed is that Bitcoin never really, like all the change that were made on Bitcoin never really helped merchant adoption. Um, they, you know, like the solution for this guy would be, oh, just use, you know, wallet of Satoshi on your phone, but that's, that's not correct. Right. And that's something that I don't want to go too much into conspiracy, but I think everyone listening to this podcast should ask themselves the question, why is that the case? Yeah. Yeah. That's, uh. Yeah, totally, totally valid points. Yeah, like, uh, um, which, yeah, I guess the, uh, you know, the the NGU Bitcoin maxis would, would just, uh, you know, take the the gold standard approach. But again, like, uh, um, if, if if this is, you know, supposed to be the, you know, you know, the unsensible money or whatever, um, and hopefully private money. I mean, at least, you know, according even according to Satoshi, which he's not God, but you know, it's supposed to be pseudonymous at least. But yeah, if you buy your pseudonymous, you know, your quote unquote pseudonymous Bitcoin on a KYC exchange, that really doesn't help you out too much. Um, but uh yeah no like uh, it's it's yeah it's 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 a super hard problem um cuz like uh you know who needs Bit you know who needs bitcoin who needs monero who needs privacy well everyone needs it um like you need it if you want to have any any you know livelihood at all um truly right so um yeah it's it's a super hard problem like uh, you you do some you know some like uh if you have to do basic tech support for anybody it's, it's usually just like super ba it's 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 super easy stuff or like coming across like like you're saying like uh if they have a Microsoft machine, they're just using Edge, like the default browser. Like there's nothing good about Microsoft Edge as far as I know. Like there's like even Google Chrome, if it's going to track you, like Google Chrome is obviously the superior solution. Um, but like they just don't change any defaults at all. So like, yeah, like how, how do you, you know, give it's the, the mass adoption thing is in my, in, in my opinion, just the pipe dream. So like what are, what are the Macs he's actually selling? Yeah, no. Yes. Yeah, Samurai, I remember Samurai wallet on my show said that he actually thought that the people who accepted Bitcoin had decreased since he got into it um, around 2013. I always thought that was interesting. And nowadays, my Twitter feed is flooded with these bizarre, bizarre Bitcoin maxis who are talking about how, yeah, you know, they've got off their three day fast. And now they um, they wouldn't have been able to do that without Satoshi. Like what? It, it, it's such a it 
honestly, it's such a cult, some of these Bitcoiners. And I know they're not using Bitcoin. I know they're not. I, I, we see them on our shop. These people are not using Bitcoin. I'll, I'll tell you what. So I don't know what they have it for. Well, we do know what they have it for. They have this theory that something has to be held, that has to be saved in order for it to be valuable. I think that is wrongheaded for many reasons. Uh, I don't think there is a correlation to gold with, with Bitcoin because it's not a physical thing. It needs to be spent if it is going to have value in the long run and not just go off a cliff one day. So yeah, the the the, the maxis really have it wrong. Um, I'm actually working on a book called Lies About Bitcoin and uh, I'm going to confront some of this stuff head on and hopefully get the, the true vision of Bitcoin that Satoshi, Samurai Wallet, and all the people listening, uh, no doubt, are familiar with and probably get a ton of five-star and one-star reviews for that book. Oh, that's that's amazing. Also, here, um, go ahead, Urban. Yep, go ahead, Urban. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm aware of a bit of a lag, but um, I would say two things. Uh, number one is how do you improve privacy in Bitcoin? just use it as peer-to-peer -peer money that on its own will do mixing that on its own will have many people using changing and then it becomes extremely hard uh, to to uh, trace just because of the sheer amount of volume and data the other part of this is you know if you're in bitcoin like bitcoin has two Two things, let's say it has the NGU, you know, number go up, and then it has the other uh, aspect of it, which is um, money and peer-to-peer and -peer cash. If you're just using half of it, you miss the, you miss the point. Like if you just uh, use it for payment, uh, then when it pumps, uh, you won't benefit uh, from having more capital available to you. And I know so many merchants that accepted it immediately, changed it for fiat, and now they just have their eyes to cry because they completely miss uh, the amazing return that it had. And then on the other side, if you only do NGU, uh, well, you also miss the point that you now have uh, uncensorable money that you can just spend and change. And you need to practice now. like. You know, um, if you have the equivalent of the executive order to seize the gold and you don't know how to use a self-custodial wallet and you're coin around Coinbase and now you're panicking because you have 24 hours to withdraw M or some shit like this, that's just not, not going to cut it. So you need to practice spending. You need to encourage merchant adoption. And this is why I think it's important to have both. Uh, in order to fully enjoy what Bitcoin is. Yeah. Yeah. hundred percent. Yeah. I mean, that, that's, yeah, it's, it's, yeah. Yeah. Certainly agree. Um, so I've been going for about an hour. I mean, I've got a couple other, uh, I guess a, a couple other questions that would probably be big ones, but I guess to, to get off the, the tech questions a little bit, like this has been amazing guys, like seriously. Um, yeah. Like, uh, for a lot of reasons, but um, I guess to get to maybe a less technical question, one to kind of close out a more general liberation um, might be a good way, especially for the Vonnie podcast here. But uh, um, again, I'm not sure. I, I I don't assume that people know know things anymore. But um, so yeah, Vonnie, um, a pursuit of an invulnerability to coercion, um, lifestyle changes uh, in the pursuance of an invulnerability to coercion. Um, so there's a lot of them, obviously a lot of them, but, um, I guess just generally speaking, if you look at the, uh, the landscape today, uh, taking into account things like the, the sovereign individual, which is huge in the Bitcoin movement and I, or the Bitcoin community. And I understand why to a certain extent, um, we're seeing some of those legal interstice opportunities. The, uh, the country shopping is what Rayo called it in the 1960s and seventies. Um, but this country shopping, um, with, digital currency with, you know, like Bitcoin, um, like Bitcoin passports, things like that. Um, these opportunities are going to become, you know, more and more available. Um, and the landscape of the, of, of the world is going to change. And I think a lot faster than what, what a lot of people think. Um, so with you guys, you know, being on, on the front line for, for a lot of this stuff, I mean, um, again, generally non-technical related, you can say as much or as little, and maybe it's, maybe it's like, I don't really have much to say on this and that's, that's great too. But, um, yeah, I guess what are your thoughts on, uh, digital nomadism, country shopping, um, you know, some of these, these radical alternative lifestyles, like living on a van, uh, living in a van or on sailboats, um, you know, like, uh, I guess some of these radical lifestyle changes in, in this modern, modern landscape, um, you know, like, uh, I guess, Maybe it, maybe it relates to what you're doing now, but what lifestyle seems to be the most invulnerable to coercion in, in the modern day? Um, and again, not just, I mean, 
these physical lifestyle changes will incorporate digital. So we're not leaving that behind. But I'm just curious, general general thoughts on that question. Yeah, I'll just throw a few things out here. There's a lot better people to be speaking on the subject, many of whom have been and will be on your show. These are all good options for people to consider which country they live in. If they live in a country like the US, which state, if they do live in a particular state, I just had somebody on my show who explains how to become a nomad within the US by becoming a resident of South Dakota. That's certainly the best option if you live in the US, if you want to still have a legitimate address, which is still important because look, you can go off the grid, you can be the next Ted Kaczynski, not, not bombing people hopefully, and you can just disappear and not take advantage at all of modern society and all of the fruits that it has brought us. I don't think that is, that's not what I would prefer. I would prefer to take advantage of, of what we have um, and not totally go off grid. And, you know, I, I've sat around for years and decades while people say, you know, it, it's the end, this is it. This is the last year, this is when the chaos happens and it comes and goes. And so I definitely want to keep a foot in to this stuff while also having maybe the additional passport, while also having the farmland to bug out in, and maybe you've already started, you know, you've already moved part of your family uh, is living there. So these are all good things to consider. I would just encourage people not to, um, you know, th there, there's an in-between space and you don't have to be all in. Yes. And, and before you jump in, Urban, um, I'm happy you brought that up and I might cut out some of this for the podcast. I don't want to release this entire legal interstice because um, it's, it's pretty, pretty, pretty drastic. But um, South Dakota thing, that's that's very interesting time. I've been looking at um, I've got a source. Um, I've been using it for I got pulled over with it. Um, but uh, I've got a Mexican driver's license I paid for in Bitcoin. Um, it comes with a receipt from the DMV. Um, and I've again, it's like this is just, I've, it's a, a message away. Um yeah, it's it's a uh, so so I'm with you, Gabriel. Um, that like the legal interstices in terms of like that. So Rayo talked about they're called legal interstices in Vanu terminology. Um, legal loopholes, quote unquote, might be the the newer way to think about it. But these are things that you you certainly use when you can, but you never rely upon them. Um, so yes, yeah, so like that's yeah, hundred percent with you. Um, hundred percent with you. Um, but Urban, uh, yeah, or actually Gabriel, yeah, jump in. Um, if you got a response to that, I'll and I'll, I'll open up to Urban. No, just just to say that this the, this is good thinking on your part, and that having international driver's license does work in other countries. So that is certainly mm -hmm. a strategy. I have an episode called I think it's Andrew Tate's Privacy and Freedom Tactics, and that's one of the things he talks about. So oh, nice. you yeah. can go and listen to that one to just get some ideas, if nothing else. Yes, it's an International Driving Act of 1947, I think. Um, and again, it worked in a police encounter, uh, an unexpected police encounter. Um, so yeah, I guess it, it wasn't a hundred percent like legally correct, but they weren't gonna they weren't gonna cause trouble. Um, but Urban, yeah, what I guess uh, open up to you, man. Um, what are your thoughts? I think COVID uh, has shown and maybe uh, also has has educated a lot of people that having multiple passport is very helpful, and we have seen people uh, certainly like um, using this. Uh, there were uh, many people unable to leave uh, UK, for instance, and then they just used their second passport uh, to uh, tell that they were uh, seeing their family. And I think this is good, and it's always good to have many options. And it's also good that you you test those options uh, before uh, shit happens. You know, this is important um, to uh, not. Uh, just wait for the end of the world and then, uh, as we have said in, in the case of Bitcoin, and then wonder uh, how all of this is, is going to work. Um, one thing uh, about this, uh, wait, I, I lost my train of thought. Ah, yes, yes. So um, about the sovereign individual, I have a bit of a different take than many people. I believe most uh, humanity will not really be sovereign. I, I think there are certain like it's not for everyone uh, to become sovereign individual. It requires certain mindset, but you can onboard people uh, if you have this mindset. You can basically onboard people. So I, I give you an example. I'm part of an initiative to have uh, open uh, Wi-Fi mesh networks so that um, easily uh, go to. Uh, there, um, people could easily 
connect to free Wi-Fi. And what I've noticed with, uh, with this is that, oh, I think I lost my connection again. I, I hope, uh, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. anyway, so uh, I'm part of an initiative uh, to have open Wi-Fi and mesh networks. And the idea is that you can share your Wi-Fi connection uh, with anyone. And that can be, so um, part of this uh, free Wi-Fi and the idea is to provide non-protected access to internet. And if you think things where it's increasingly hard to gain access to internet without showing some kind of uh, ID or without uh, putting a phone number, even if the Wi-Fi is technically free. And I believe those are little things that uh, you, you might not have everybody with sovereign individual, but you might enable a lot of people along the way uh, to gain some freedom and to have access um, in, in this. Um, yeah, so that's that's my take on it. I'm, I'm sorry if it's a bit weird, but having constantly the pop up with disconnecting and stuff makes it hard to to keep track on what I'm saying. It, it's fine. I'm, I'm OK to finish up this uh, this show, Urban, so. Yeah, I guess what what I'll say, yeah, ever not, no, no worries on the on the connection, brother. Um, it was, yeah, it was, uh, yeah, amazing, um, amazing to, to to have you. And I guess, uh, yeah, it seems like the the connection's getting worse and worse. Um, so yeah, I guess maybe we'll li- li- leave it to Gabriel, um, for for the rest of this. But yeah, it was tr- truly an honor, brother. So, uh, well, yeah, that, I guess that's uh, that's 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 generally it. I guess there there was only one comment I had uh, in response to, to to Urban was. Um, yeah, like you're saying, you, you can't save everyone in the sovereign individual. Not everyone will be autonomous, et cetera. And, and that's that's certainly true. Um, that's certainly true. Um, that's why Rayo disappeared and kind of just gave up on everybody. Or at least we, that's what people, that's what we think happened to him. We don't know. Um, but uh, but yeah, I guess just, just in, in the modern day, um, I guess medically this could be called triage, where you, you find those you can help um, and leave those you can't. It's not that you don't care about them, but um, if they won't help themselves in any way, there's just nothing you can do about it. Um, you know, there is, you know, free will, um, and all, and you know, all that stuff. So, um, yeah, so I don't leave anybody, anybody behind, but I think urban makes a very good point there that, yeah, most people won't, won't take up, um, a lot of these solutions, but we're not trying to find everybody. We're just trying to find those that are looking for these solutions. But, um, yeah, Gabriel, I guess, uh, um, any closing thoughts for the listeners? Um, and, and please make sure after you give your closing thoughts, uh, plug away on, on your book and, um, your podcast and, uh, whatever else, uh, and the course and whatever else you'd like to. I think I'll just say, don't take the the black pill. That's that's the biggest mistake that you can take. Um, it, it, it is very self destructive. You may as well just get give up entirely. At that point, there are options, there are solutions out there. Logic tells us that if Tor was compromised, if some of these things were compromised, that there would be a lot of people arrested. So you can have some privacy. Um, if you're worried about things like Intel Management Engine, you can even get around those. Uh, if you have the determination, it really is a a process. And so start the process, go to the next step, go to the next step. Don't be content to be on the lower rungs. Privacy is certainly within your grasp. Um, and yeah, and, and I'll just say that the course that we mentioned, escapethetechnocracy.com, if you use the code BONU, V-O-N-U, then you will get a little bit of discount and you'll be supporting both my work and the work of this current podcast. And that's a really good place to get started for kind of digital sovereignty uh, and privacy. We've we've built that in a way to be applicable to the beginner and intermediate user. And I think pretty quickly as well to the advanced user. And so that is what I would say as my final thoughts. Yeah, yeah. And uh, again, I'd, I'd recommend even, even like I said, 2020 was when I really went down to Linux and uh, privacy rabbit hole on like action. And, um, you know, we'd already done a couple of years of, of, uh, of the Crypto Anarchy series um, here on, on the Vanu podcast. So I wasn't an amateur, but a lot of the stuff is just, um, yeah, it's, it's, it, it can be complex. And, um, yeah, the course at escapethetechnocracy.com. Um, well, yeah, it, it'll make things a lot easier. Um, again, if I would have had this course, I, I would have been wise to, to take it back then. Um, but, yeah, Gabriel, it's been amazing, brother. Um, Urban's not here, but it was amazing to have him on um, as well. I don't think he's here. Maybe he's here. But uh, amazing having him. I guess the last thing I'll say um, for this podcast, and we'll close it out, um, depending on upon how busy I am over the coming weeks, uh, this may be the last podcast released before Bonifest 5, uh, the premier gathering of liberation here at Veritas, Pasnio. 
uh, there's still time to make plans to come out. Uh, there's still time to get vetted, uh, whether you're already vetted and just have questions or need the location details, uh, or if you need help getting vetted, uh, email coordinator at paznia.com uh, or DM wherever is convenient, uh, but preferably Simplex uh, at this point if you're in the Paznia network. Um, Paul Rosenberg will be here the Monday of Vonifest. Uh Matt Presti, former president of Walter Russell's University of Science and Philosophy, will be here for the weekend. Sky Huddleston, breakthrough energy pioneer, uh, entrepreneur and creator of the Liberator rocket heater, uh, and builder of the new and improved Bork engine, which um, if you haven't listened to my episode, I think it's bonniepodcast.com slash 139 with Scott. Maybe there's a, maybe it's the newer, maybe there's a newer one after that. It might be a newer one. But yeah, the potentialized of this Bork engine are wild as shit, um, especially when you think about like Bitcoin mining, but um, we won't get there um, right now. Um, but Scott should be there in attendance, I'm hoping. Um, it's hard to um, hard to keep track of him. But uh, which I guess is good. Uh, and in terms of liberational activities, we'll probably process a lamb, uh, probably a dozen or so chickens, uh, potentially some self-defense training with Pat Henry, uh, our pseudonymous Pat Henry, and uh, maybe a special screening of the documentary on J.I. Gertrude's life called Meetings, Meetings with Remarkable Men. Um, but anyways, thanks so much for being here. Thanks so much to Gabriel and Urban for this amazing discussion. Uh, until next time, cheers. The intent of the Ghostpad is to offer a complete security and privacy hardened computer system that is built from the ground up to be an effective direct action countermeasure for those who want to actively resist the privacy intrusions of the, the entire surveillance state Hydra, both public sector and private sector. A user-friendly computer that the owner maintains exclusive control over every aspect of its operation and has complete control over who accesses what data. A ghost pad is your virtual corner of the room where the cameras, microphones, and other data collection devices have no power. After all, power comes from ownership, which is exclusive control. Unlike practically any other available option, when you buy a ghost pad you are truly its owner. And while the masses beg and bleed to their political corporate masters to loosen their chains, ghost pad owners can use their systems as virtual bolt cutters and cut themselves free. Ghost pads are high-quality business rugged laptops that have had the security compromising system firmware, BIOS firmware, Intel management engine, etc., removed and replaced with more secure, free and open-source alternatives. The closed-source binary BIOS firmware has been removed from the system board and replaced with free, as in freedom, alternatives as well as the Intel management engine also being neutralized. That combination makes them more secure by design, and preemptively thwarts any attempts by threat actors, both public and private, to gain access by exploiting its vulnerabilities, either by an engineered in and hidden backdoor, or a zero-day exploit in the factory, supplied firmware or the Intel management engine. Perhaps the most important security privacy enhancing feature these systems have, is the neutralizing of the aforementioned Intel management engine, I'm. The IM is a separate computer and a computer that is embedded into all Intel platforms made since 2008. It has its own operating system called Minix. It operates out of band meaning that your primary CPU has no access to monitor what it is doing, and it has direct access to all the hardware that your primary CPU does, making it the ultimate embedded spying device. If you can't audit what it's doing, it's always on when the computer is plugged in, or has battery power, it has its own network interface with its own MAC address that can bypass any system firewall configuration, it has its own storage you have no access to, it can access your microphone, camera, keyboard, can record keystrokes, and display, can screenshot your encrypted communications, while you are reading and writing them. The IM can only be disabled, by modifying the system's firmware. That can only be accomplished by using an external programmer to reprogram the chip that stores the system's firmware. Only select laptop models can be modified. We concentrate on the compatible models with the highest performance available. We offer models that are 2x as powerful as any configuration sold and supported by Lenovo. Transitioning your computing activity to privacy-hardened platforms is a direct action strategy to resist the attempts at total omnipresence by the surveillance state. To put it simply, these systems are some of the few available that are likely compromised in some way on the firmware level, so they are some of the most secure and private available for use cases where that those attributes are the most important. It is also why systems configured this way are considered as ideal to use as a base to install a security privacy hardened OS, such as Cubes OS, Parrot OS, or other privacy focused Linux distributions. On. To view the full selection of ghost pads, ghost phones, and other privacy tools available via Liberty under attack publications, just visit libertinderattack.com forward slash privacy tools. What are you waiting for? Step up your security culture today. Again, libertinderattack.com forward slash privacy tools. Liberty under attack publications, share your story, find your freedom.
because that's really the issue that we're dealing with with these, you know, ghost phones, ghost pads, whatever, is that there's no way that you can organize with, with other people and have these distributed tribes if you have a snitch in your pocket all the time. Mm -hmm. People are literally wearing wires all the time. They have a snitch in their pocket and they're trying to do clandestine things. That's never going to work. You know, I'm focused on this project now because I really see how the unfettered flow of communication is what really has prompted this, you know, shift in consciousness. And that if this does, if this can't continue this way and people can't communicate freely with each other, then all the dis distributed networks that have formed um, aren't going to be very effective and they're not going to, uh, they're not going to be able to do what they could do. Um, if you can't communicate, especially when you're basically part of a dispersed tribe at this point, if you can't communicate without being monitored, it basically hamstrings anything, you know, anything going forward. Step up your privacy and order a ghost phone today. Just visit libertyunderattack.com forward slash ghost phone, again libertyunderattack.com forward slash ghost phone. And make sure to keep a lookout for more ghost pads, privacy tools, freedom boxes, and more. Libertyunderattack.com is the website. Liberty Under Attack Publications. Share your story. Find your freedom.